Do liberals see the dangers of puberty blockers? Hi, welcome to Answers News for Monday, November 28th, 2022. I'm Tim Chafee, and I'm joined with Dr. Gabriella Haynes and Rocket Rob Webb today That's for me. Answered News. We're going to be discussing the dangers of puberty blockers and the New York Times, in addition to other news stories. But let's start with that one. Even the New York Times is worried about the irreversible damage of puberty blockers. And so this article is highlighting what many of us have been calling out for for several years now, that um, with this modern push in the last five years or so to to get these young people, maybe as young as 10, 11, 12, who think that they have been born in the wrong body or that they should be transitioning to a different gender, um, that what some experts have been recommending is to give them puberty blockers so that they can delay that decision. But imagine this, there are consequences for that, such as? Yeah, I mean, they, they t talk about here, they have um, different bone density problems, they have osteoporosis, they say other experts are actually warning that puberty blockers have an impact on the brain that we did not yet fully understand. Permanent infertility is likely for those who took the drugs from a young age. Um, and just, you just think about the, the permanent damage from these children, from these young children who can't even decide maybe their bedtime or, or different decisions throughout their life, yet they can make these permanent mutilation decisions at such a young age, and we're seeing it. It's just, it's just really heartbreaking to see story after story. And it's not just a one-off, too. It's not just that one case. We're seeing it over and over and over again. As, as the years come by and the years progress, we're seeing more of these cases of these kids that are taking these puberty blockers and they're permanently destroying themselves. And we actually have a really good video on YouTube that our, one of our speakers, Brian Osborne, just did. It's called When Trans People Regret Transitioning. Um, Brian does a really good job basically talking about all the different stories, talking about all the different cases of people that have been taking these puberty blockers, trying to what's called detransition or transition to different genders. And that's really what it comes down to is they're basically rejecting what God has made already. Like it says in Genesis 127, he created us all male and female from the beginning. So what, what they're having is they're having these broken feelings of that whatever gender that they think is in their mind, they're going against what God has made for them in the beginning. But the thing is, we all have broken feelings. We've all sinned, right? But it's, it's not the loving thing to affirm the sin. What the loving thing is, is to point them to the gospel of Jesus Christ to be made into a new creation. That's what we say all the time here. We're a biblical authority ministry, but we're rooted in the gospel. We point people that are struggling with these feelings. So if you are watching today and you're struggling with maybe some of these transgender feelings, know that there is hope in Christ, that he can make you a new creation in Christ. Well, you're messing with hormones, so what can you expect? You're messing with hormones right when they're um, um, popping, you know, in the body and the brain, and it just, it's just going to destroy the whole thing. Not only the body, the mind, as we have seen, the feelings. Now there's a lot of people, because they have been damaged, they go, they transition, and then they go back, and then when they go back, it's already... Too, too late. A lot of those changes don't come back, you know, and now you, for the rest of your life, now you have a lot of uh, problems just because when you were around 12 or 11 or something, you just decided that you don't want to be something. But like, we all have struggles, but we don't act on them. You know, we have to have principles. We have to have the laws that guide us. And that's God's word. God's word is what leads us to the right decision. Even though many times we struggle, many times we don't want to make those decisions, many times we go against all that we want and other people want, but that's the right thing. So we have to be very careful with, the, with what the, the media, and then we see it here in this paper saying that um, an increasing number of, of uh, young people are identifying themselves as transgender. Why does this number increase increasing? The media, the movie, the songs, you know, um, uh, schools, the peer schools, pressure. Is school, the peer pressure. That's why those numbers is increasing. And we have talked about, I think it was like a couple weeks ago, we talked about a number of like what, 500, 500 percent increase in, increase one, in one district. I think it was in Maryland. The, yeah, the, the school district, 500 percent increase. And then you can say like, What's going on? You have to think, we have to say that it's just the pressure, it's a social pressure teaching them, hey, if you don't want to be a woman, you know, can you be a boy? And just like kind of pushing this idea, it's making those people just kind of be like, you know what? 
And especially at this age, around 13, 12, 17, with the kind of rebellion that's coming also. So they just want to go, oh, I want to go against the family. I want to go against the, you know, things like that. So uh, we all, as parents, because this at the end of the day, it's a call for us, parents, Mm -hmm. to teach our kids the right way, Mm -hmm. to teach the kids God's word. Because as not only teach, as we were talking before, live. Mm -hmm. Without living God's word in our life, we're not going to be able to do anything. The Bible says in 1 Peter 3.15, honoring Christ first as our Lord and Savior. That's the only way that we're going to be able to give any answer to anyone. So it's very important for us um, to be aware of what's going on. Yeah, and th- what you're doing, you're seeing at the, mo- really, I think the most vulnerable age, the, the, these formative years where everybody does struggle, as we've talked about, and that's a very tough age when you, your body's changing and all sorts of other things, and it's just to to tell them this is the solution I, is one of the worst forms of abuse I can imagine. Mm-hmm. And um, for the people who are struggling with those sorts of things, going back to what Dr. Uh, Haynes was saying, having a loving family, having somebody in their life who will show them unconditional love and let them know that, that they will always be there for them. It's such a huge thing rather than, you know what, you need to change to this. Yeah, take then the you're going to finally be happy because you're not going to find no. that peace and joy out, outside yourself. The only place that's going to happen is through Christ ultimately. Yeah. And this so, ta- so they need examples of who Christ is right. in their lives. The stats show that uh, people involved with transgender or transitioning, they have a high number of suicide, of being involved with drugs, you know, all of those, all of those things. Um, and actually, they... They, we all are supposed to live, what, here in the United States, 70, around 70, 72? For age? Age, uh, yeah. 70, 78 for 78. female. 78. Yeah. For mm-hmm. those people, it's way less than that. Way, way, way less than that. And, and the lie that you're going to be told on that is that's because Christians persecute them. Yes. Uh, and yet there's, mm-hmm. there's no solid evidence of that. No, it's, not it's at just, all. No. So we, we need to move on. But this article mentions another book by Abigail Schreier, Irreversible Damage. This is a woman who's not a Christian who has written on this topic. And this book, it's heartbreaking, but she interviews a bunch of people who have gone through the different surgeries, different procedures to transition, and how, and many times how much they regret it. And one of the things she talked about, and I thought was very astute, is what's happening in many of these cases. And she talked about the types of families they're usually coming from are the ones who don't put boundaries on their children at all, you know, where... It, parents who have different rules, the kids naturally sometimes want to rebel. And when they hit that first fence, that, that rule, they know they've hit a boundary. But the parents who let them do whatever, it's not until they get so far down the road where it's like, hey, mom, I think I want to be a boy now. Where finally the parent says, whoa, something's wrong and I have to be a parent. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so, yeah, we need to move on to our next <laughs> article. So we're going to go from puberty blockers to uh, sun blockers. Sun blockers, yeah. So <laughs> block the sun is Lex Luthor, now the Secretary of Energy for Biden. So this is an article that talks about how one of the proposals from the Biden administration to stop climate change is to figure out a way to block the sun. And you know what? It's funny. Such a dumb idea. My, my. <laughs> that this is a real article? <laughs> like, this is actually, like, I, I, like, when I saw this, I was like, is this a Babylon Bee, like, satire? Yeah, like, that's what real? I thought. <laughs> it, that's the thing. Because I'm not from here, uh, sometimes I read something and I'm just like, is my English working today yeah. or what? Yeah, see, I'm I've, like, I've lived here my whole life and I was wondering the same thing. <laughs> it's working better than the person who came up with yeah. this idea. Well, and, this, and, and this is so, I mean, it's terrible. And it's funny. And I was talking to my, my father in law, he came to drop me off here. And then I was telling him about this article, and then he started laughing. I was like, don't laugh, it's serious. That's mm-hmm. what they're trying to do. And he's like, what? Are you joking with me? I'm like, no. Yeah, they're saying they want to spray aerosols into the atmosphere to reflect the power of the sun and modify the Earth's climate. What possibly could go wrong, right? And so, nothing. <laughs> nothing. I just kept thinking, like, right. in terms of Wisconsin, you know, Minnesota, people New York. Up, up store, New We're York. We're all for global warming. I don't know if they're, <laughs> they're on board with that, that decision. It's yeah. already cold enough there. But, Leave I us mean, in peace. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and I, I just like my first thought was, what about all the solar panels that they're trying to constantly push on? And they're not going to be able to power those, right? right. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what, I mean, yeah. spray aerosol. It's, it's got to be a different thing than what was in the hairspray in the '80s, right, ladies? I mean, before we were told, <laughs> no, don't do that. That's going to yeah. destroy don't the ozone layer. But that, that, don't talk about hair. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I, I think that was discriminatory. What do you guys yeah, think? I think so. I think so. Man. But yeah, this is just another ridiculous back then, example. They were, were destroying the ozone by doing it, but now yeah. do it? What's the. Uh, yeah, area? that's a really good point. But you know what? It's interesting. At the end of the day, they're trying to solve a problem that 
not there's a no problem. problem. Right. It's not a problem. Right. So that's the thing. They're just trying and spending a lot of tax money on this. Oh, there's the key. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of tax money <laughs> on this to, to solve a problem that it's not a problem. Also, it's just an example of man thinking that he's God and that he can control yes. the atmosphere. And it says in Job 9, 7, he commands the sun and it does not rise. So it's only God that can do that. So you see that they're basically substituting themselves right. in the place of God to be able to control the environment, control the radiation from the sun. And God told, no, you know, in Genesis 8, after, after the flood, that summer, winter, springtime, and harvest will not cease. That God's going to preserve 8, those things. He's going to maintain yeah. those things and, right. until Yeah, he the says, end. while yeah. the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. And also, I just thought about Romans 125 as well, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the, cre the creation rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Basically, all of this uh, environmental uh, climate change alarmism, it really is the worship of the creation rather than the creator. That's what we're seeing here all the mm -hmm. time. That's what we say all the time. It's, it's, it's this cult religion, basically, right, that you're elevating what God has created, putting your time and money and effort into that rather than the true one that God actually created everything around us instead. Yeah. And he's the one who upholds all things by the word yeah. of his power. So if you didn't get the title of the article, Lex Luthor is the one of the villains from Superman. And Rob yeah. and I are not really comic book yeah. experts, so we're going to let Dr. Haynes. Yeah, Dr. Haynes the comic is book the book DC <laughs> comic expert here. No, no, not at all. I know nothing about this. <laughs> he's like moving on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah, it does oh, seem oh, like oh, something oh, from oh, a superhero just, movie where it's just so mm -hmm. we're going to block the sun. Or we're gonna <laughs> this is yeah. just, a, yeah, just a really dumb, dumb yeah. idea. Yeah, it's just but as we're going to see, I mean, from this article that they need to do something like this because to save the Earth from global warming, well, the next article says Earth can regulate its own temperature over millennia. <laughs> new study finds. Yeah, it just contradicts everything they just yeah. said before. And, and that's the thing. When we read the papers, when, that's, that's a, it's a warning for all of us. When we read papers like that, we have to read very carefully mm -hmm. to see the assumptions, to see what they're trying to convey, what they're trying to reach with that idea. Because sometimes you read and it's like, well, this is a really good idea. Okay, but what is, what is in the back, like uh, Broad was saying, just like trying to worship the, the nature, you know, the, the creature, and not the creator, trying to play God. So that's what they're all trying to do. So that's very important. And, and, and here you see studies finding that, you know, that's how it works. God created the earth to just regulate your own temp its own temperature. Right. Now, this is something they stretch out over millions of years yeah. because that's part of their worldview. Mm -hmm. And we would look at it and say, well, yeah, the temperature has remained fairly steady since God created things just mm -hmm. thousands of years ago. So that's not surprising. And what they're saying is that these... The, as the rocks are weathering, you know, as you get rain and everything, carries certain uh, rocks, so it's uh, silicate rocks, are uh, trapping some of the, the carbon dioxide and carrying that into the ocean. So that prevents the long-term global warming. It kind of fixes it. And then they go on and say, and we're able to, uh, able to observe this at small intervals of just thousands of years rather than just, these big just hundreds of thousands of year mm -hmm. chunks. And guess what? This is what's keeping everything intact. And <laughs> so, um, well, first of all, the millions yeah. of years didn't happen. Right. Second of all, it's God is the one who's holding all things together. Mm -hmm. So there's, uh, it, there's good research that goes into this as far as what's happening mm -hmm. when these rocks are being weathered, and then you're getting a lot of storytelling on right. top of it. Not yeah, as much as just, we're going to hear uh, in one of the later articles, but this one. Yeah, just ahead. kind of a quick summary here. So basically what they did is they analyzed these average global temperatures over so-called 66 million years using these deep sea uh, you know, temperature records of Antarctic ice cores and all this stuff, which are, by the way, loaded with assumptions upon assumptions. And they found patterns of this stabilizing feedback that happened to coincide, like we were saying, that with the silicate weather, weathering model, so essentially all those gases being trapped in rocks. And so they're saying because of that, because we found this, therefore this is how it happened. But you think about it, just the fallacies involved with that, that's affirming the consequent fallacy right there. And it's also begging the question as well. They're trying to assume what they're trying to prove. And it's also a faulty premise of incorrectly assuming that the Earth in the beginning with is millions of years old. We would say that, that the Earth is only thousands of years old, going back to, uh, to, to Noah's flood. And, um, Basically, it's, it's just this over and over again that you see with these kind of evolutionary um, articles, like Gabby was saying, you got to watch out for the language here as well. Don't be deceived by the language. They say it all the time about you know, the direct evidence, that they directly observe these things, but really, all of this is within a computer model. Right. So they're modeling all this stuff, and so they didn't actually observe all of this happened over the 66 million years. Unless they're a ghost. 
Yeah, unless they're a ghost, of course. So, and, and like we say all the time, you know, models are only as good as your initial assumptions. You know, you get them wrong, your model is going to be useless. That's what we mm -hmm. say all the time. You know, wrong assumptions leads to wrong conclusions. So and Rob, Rob's too young to remember this. Back in the 80s, we had a <laughs> saying about computers programming garbage in. Garbage, garbage out. out. That's yeah. right. It's as simple as that. And what it comes down to is they've already rejected God's word and what he says in the book of Genesis. And like the last few articles we talked about, that really is the root problem with the transgender movement, with the, the blocking of the sun, you know, all these ridiculous, you know, out there, all these ideas that are out there. It comes down to a rejection of God's word yeah. and God's word alone based on Genesis. Like we talked about Genesis 127, male and female. You reject Genesis 127, anything goes. You reject Genesis 8. 22 of God upholding the seasons, well, then anything goes from there. And so that's what we're coming to. That's what we talk about all the time, the importance of the book of Genesis. That really is the foundation. Mm -hmm. That's the foundation for everything, yeah. for every doctrine in the Bible. Well, speaking of doctrines in the Bible, the, what we, I think we could pretty much, I think we could agree this is the key one, the most exactly. important one, yep. uh, why teens don't understand who Jesus is. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, this is uh, rather heartbreaking. They talked about uh, less than 50% of young people who were interviewed or who were surveyed believe that Jesus is loving. So 49% and just a very low rates with 25,000 people being teenagers being surveyed. And uh, so what's happening so much in our culture is that young people are rejecting the Christian faith at a larger and larger percentage every single generation. Um, but often what they're rejecting is a stereotype of the Christian faith. They're not truly rejecting Jesus. They're rejecting maybe some bad experience they had in church or maybe Parents. mom or dad was a hypocrite or something like that. Well, guess what? We're all hypocrites in some area. We're, we all stumble and fall. And that's why, going back to what we talked about earlier, the importance of having a uh, setting a godly example as parents, that showing them what that unconditional love is, that God shows us. Because let's face it, those of us who are believers, how many times have we stumbled and fallen mm -hmm. on our faces? And yet God still says, yeah, I still love you. You're, I'm still here. And picks it back and up. And sometimes and, some teenagers might say like, you know, that's why. And it's used as a justification. That's why I'm, I'm a rebel. That's why I don't want anything with Jesus, God, because my parents, you know, they're a hypocrite. But you know what? You're also going to be a parent. So become you the right one. Mm -hmm. You start doing the right thing for your kids. It's just not, don't just blame your parents or your family, your church, or whatever happened. You turn into a real Christian and can uh, set the example for others because that's something that uh, can bless many, many other people because as Tim was saying, you know, like those teens, they have no idea what they're talking about. Jesus is loving. Okay, but what, what is Jesus? Is Jesus a prophet? Is Jesus God? Is Jesus a, just a man? You know, they have to understand just, that. Is it just a curse word? Is yeah, a, you know, just a, as you said. So, I mean, they, they have no idea what they're um, talking about. And, and I think that even though the it's showing some good findings, I think they're actually way worse than mm -hmm. what they are. Yeah, they mentioned in here, they say 50% of young people raised in the Christian home leave church at 18, but it's actually way more than that. It's actually more like 90% mm -hmm. of Christians that have been raised in the Christian home are leaving the church. And we actually have a really good resource here also called Already Gone. This is written by Ken Ham. Uh, basically what it did is it, is it um, we basically hired America's research group to go find a thousand different 20-something year olds who were raised in a solid Christian conservative church, and they're no longer attending the church. And so basically they did the research to figure out why. What, what was the main cause? What was the main reason? And really what we found out is um, it's, it's not just starting in their college years. It's in high school. It's in junior high. Junior it's even high in elementary school. school. They start having these doubts about God's word. And like we said before, it comes down to the rejection of Genesis, basically mixing um, d different religions of Big Bang, millions of years, and mm -hmm. evolution, evolution, which are secular humanist ideas, by the way. And so essentially what, what's happening is you're having multiple generations after generations generation told that you don't have to believe every single word in this Bible, in God's word, that you can reject certain parts and believe other parts. And that's really led to a mass exodus from the church. And they, they even point that out here in the article. They basically say, um, you know, here in the UK, only 9% of people read their Bible daily. 
only 9%. So that's really what it comes down to is they don't have a right foundation. They don't have a right view of Jesus because they don't know who Jesus is according to God's word. They're getting their information from social media, from TikTok, from YouTube, and all Facebook. And everyone's like, well, what are, the, what are those platforms even mean? Yeah. <laughs> but all, all these social media from the internet, that's basically where they're getting their information from rather than God's word rather than from the Bible. And, and Gabby actually hit a perfect point is that as parents, we're also called to be training our children in the ways of the Lord. Like it says in Proverbs uh, 22, or what is it? Proverbs 22, 6, train up a child in the way he should go. When he is old, he will not depart from it. Ephesians 6, 4, bring them up in the dis discipline and instruction of the Lord. So it should be a reminder, a call of action really to parents to be raising up our children. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and we need to do that in a way that that both teaches them the truth and demonstrates that truth lived out in our lives. So Excellent. often what happens, they Excellent. get one or the other, and we need to, we need to teach them the truth, what God's word shows us and teaches us, and we also need to live that out every single day. And mm -hmm. as, as set the best example. as possible, set we have set that example. Exactly. And that's a call for all parents, it's a call for Christians in the church to church be leaders that, as well. that Preach the godly word. example, because we may be the only example of Jesus that those people will ever get to see. And um, all right, so let's move on to our next one. This is the world's oldest meal. Helps mm -hmm. us, it's probably a McDonald's fry. Yeah, yeah. It just, it helps us unravel <laughs> mystery of our earliest animal kind ancestors. Kind of looks like it, doesn't it, huh? <laughs> um, but, uh, so this is, uh, this is from uh, some fossils that were found in the White Sea, which is on the, like between the northwest part of Russia, close to Finland, uh, so just outside the Arctic cir Circle, and they found a couple things that uh, Dr. Haynes would be interested in because she's the paleontologist of the crew yep. here, and they were able to study the um, the contents. They weren't able to directly study the contents of the stomach, but through microscopes, they were able to see the molecular level of, and figure out what these things ate, and then they attached their evolutionary story to it. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, it just. Again, every single time you're reading, we have to understand the assumptions, what they're trying to conceive, what they're trying to say with that. So Separate the facts from the fiction here. Yes, it's very important because without that, we, we're just going to read and not understand anything. Because, for example, in this paper, it talks about this um, creature that was found, this animal that was found 550 million years ago. 550 million years ago. But the thing is, it's still preserved what this thing ate. How can something that 550 million years ago can have those, the, the, what it ate still preserved? It cannot. That alone shows that there's something wrong right there. The, only, the other thing is also that the properties that this thing is using in the physiology uh, is the same that other animals do today. Yeah, said so modern animals have the same method. Yeah, so 550 million years to today, nothing has changed. Mm -hmm. That alone can show you there is something very, very wrong here. So where these are found, they're at the bottom of the ocean. Mm -hmm. And so they look at this and say, oh, this is this. The, because of these layers that we find it in, this is what Cambrian. We're talking mm -hmm. upper yeah. Pre-Cambrian rock mm -hmm. layers. So this is probably, probably right around near the beginning of the flood. What layers. we would, what we would yeah. classify as the beginning of the flood. And if you think about it, what's going to get buried at the beginning of the flood? Oh, how about the things that live right at the bottom of the ocean? And what mm -hmm. do we find in that layer? That's right. what we find. That's what these yeah. things are. So it's not a surprise to us. It's, it's two different ways of looking at the same data, the same evidence, right. and the, our worldview is what guides us as we interpret that data. And people just think, oh, this is, this is fact. No, this is their worldview being applied to the data that's been observed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's lots of storytelling in here, lots of imaginary time. So I, obviously, I just couldn't stomach this one. Oh, boy. Get it? No, okay. <laughs> so obviously, this Kill is Mike. actually a I'm really great... <laughs> It's a really great example, like, like we were hinting at, observational versus historical science. It's something we talk about here at the ministry all the time. And really, if you kind of just get rid of a lot of the evolutionary assumptions, there's a lot of good observational science here studying the fossils in the present. But then once you get past that, you start interpreting the past based on your assumptions, based on your worldview, you know, that's when you're going to get into the realm of historical science. So throughout these articles, you're going to see things like the word uh, could and possibly and suggest, really suggesting that they don't really know. Um, so basically what, what it comes down to is you, you can't take a neutral approach to these evidences, to the fossil record. You, like, like they say all the time, the evidence speaks for itself. You know, evidence doesn't <laughs> speak, and if it does, you should probably run. Right. Um, again, assumptions about the past, they drive your interpretation. This is a really good example of that. Yeah, it is. 
So in, in the popular level writing, you don't usually see the suggest or maybe. It, a lot of times the, the po science popularizers, the science writers are more dogmatic, but if you read the journal articles, that's mm -hmm. where you get the yeah. suggest, mm -hmm. could yeah. be, might right, have right, been. Right. So, mm -hmm. all right, next one. Oh, boy. Bipedalism <laughs> and other tales of evolutionary yep. oddities. How many of you remember you know, going through school and you, you hear about vestigial organs as proof of evolution? You, know, you don't need your tailbone, you don't need your appendix and all that. that this whole article, that's what this is. Regardless, it doesn't matter that we know that there is purpose for these things. They just go on and talk about bad design. The, the entire article is just how poorly designed is, we are yeah, as yeah. humans. And I'll, I'll let these guys take away in just a little bit. But one thing, uh, well, two things for me. I did think there was one thing in here that was very true. Uh, this sentence, I'm going to pull it out of context, but here's what it says. It makes no sense, but this is evolution. Amen. Amen. Yeah, right, let's move on. That. That's yeah. it. <laughs> that, that, that's that's true. the truest statement that you'll find, but that is out of context. So. Yeah. But uh, from... Yeah, this article is such a useless waste of time. It's, it was. It's well, so, from so a biblical dumb. perspective, yeah. what they're not recognizing <laughs> when they look at things that they claim is poorly designed. One, how would they even know what is good? They can't really say what it is. From an evolutionary perspective, an atheistic perspective, there is no good or bad. It just right. is. Mm -hmm. So you don't get to say what is good or bad design. But yeah, from a biblical again. perspective, yeah. we are breaking down. God created this world with no death, no suffering, no disease, and this world's suffering from thousands of years of the curse and of sin and so many problems. The reason why we do have diseases and problems ultimately goes back to sin, and we're, mm. we're not evolving and getting better. We're getting worse, worse and worse, and so we're seeing these things break down. So sometimes you can point to things that, hey, that does seem to be a problem, uh, but it doesn't mean bad design. Right, so. yeah, and that's very... Um arbitrary because you know oh this is good this is bad but i mean there's a lot of things that we don't know there's a lot of things that we don't understand you know and maybe in our perspective we can see it's like oh this is not gonna it's not working well but is this just our perspective of things and then uh this is uh, a problem that normally when someone is writing a paper because they have the assumption this guy has the evolutionary assumption it was writing here he's pushing this evolutionary idea of bad design of a of a, a, a look it was just look that we, we 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 made it here you know and all of those things which is all based on the evolutionary worldview when you when you mm -hmm. get the same information based on a, on a biblical worldview, we have a totally different interpretation. Mm -hmm. And we actually have hope. Because we have hope this body here is going to go one day, you know. And be replaced by a transformed, glorified body yes, that will be you know, far better. Mm -hmm, so. Way far better. And the problem is they don't have any hope. So mm -hmm. here they're just talking about bad design, how things are bad and this and that. There's no hope here. It's just, mm -hmm. it's just lost. You know, only with a biblical um, worldview we can have hope, and the the eternal hope. It's not hope for just this earth alone, but the eternal hope. And yeah, so just a important. reminder, like it says in Genesis, you know, everything originally was very good. The word there is, is exceedingly good. If there was such a thing, exceedingly perfect, everything was perfect, and it's because of sin, because of man's transgressions. That's why we have this broken, sin cursed world around us. And so, what what this author was doing, like Tim was saying, is this author is confusing the reality of living in the fallen world with so-called bad designs. But again, from the evolutionary worldview, there's no such thing as good or bad designs. It's just what is and so obviously he's borrowing from the biblical mm -hmm. worldview even to even say things like that good design bad design and it's just a reminder that you know so sometimes we don't understand perfectly all the different functions of the human body and, and different animal functions and, and functions with within different um, you know people groups and and all, all around us but it doesn't mean that it wasn't designed for a specific purpose right so God designed everything perfectly originally but it's because of sin that's why we're seeing all this sin and essentially what this article does is it goes and looks for problems that people have had not every single person but just certain people might have back pain or certain people might have sciatica and so yeah, as a result right, oh right, see right. this is bad design well it might be because they haven't taken care of themselves right. very well. it could mm -hmm. just be yes. that because of genetics we have you know struggled over mm -hmm. genetic load mm -hmm. because we're getting worse and worse so all right well we could hammer this one all day long yeah. we do have one more to get to and that is newly elected conservative school board members in south carolina clean house banning critical race theory firing superintendent so six new school board members were put yeah. in place they were part of of uh, Moms for Liberty, and they immediately, the very first day, fired the superintendent who was pushing critical race theory. They banned that from being taught in the school. They also flagged certain. They said, "We're going to look at this these well, lists with sexually explicit material, and we're going to we're going to do what we you know we need if we need to get rid of them." We, we and then some that. good news here. 
And yeah, at least. Several, a couple of people got really upset. A couple, two of the school board members that voted against that and walked out. And there were Good. some protesters that, well, yeah, it's, it's about, do the parents have the right to know what their kids are being taught? Do they get to have a say in it? Or is it all going to mm -hmm. be pushed from a, a certain agenda from the top down? Right. And that's it's really amazing we even mm -hmm. have to talk about that. Like, that's not yeah. just a given, right? We even have to, like, defend that. But if yeah. you look at the last 20 to 30 years, what's been happening with teachers unions, others, mm -hmm. they have been pushing this idea that kids do not belong to their families. They belong state. to the state, and they belong to the school. And it's our job to raise up a gener young generation Same of socialists Hitler. and everything else. If Same you thing go, Hitler said. If you yeah. go back to, to history, who said that? That the, the kid belonged to the state and not to the parents. That's classic communism. Usually the people who say that are Marxism. not very good people in history. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. You, a, lot, a lot of the dictators, Adolf Hitler, dictators, I mean, they, they yeah, said this totalitarian, exact same thing. You know, they mm -hmm. all said the same thing. So yeah. we have to be thinking, hey, if we're hearing this from these people, let's go back to the history, go back in history and see who else said that mm -hmm. and right. what happened. You know, so we have to be very careful, very, very careful with so, all of those things. Uh, yeah. So we have somehow run out of time so quickly, must be because <laughs> I talked too long, but we got a couple of resources. Real quickly, uh, we talked in the last one about these so-called, you know, vestigial. The, the vestigial organs and other things. Yeah. They talked about Lucy, mm -hmm. and uh, so we have an, a video by the late doctor, late great Dr. Menton. Mm -hmm. uh, great. Lucy, she's mm -hmm. no lady. I highly recommend that. Also, uh, critical race theory, if you're wondering what that is, that is not just teaching the history of race relations or anything in schools. It's the exact opposite. It's that a racist essentially. ideology. It's a racist yeah. ideology that, that pits people against each other based on the, their ethnicity, based on the level of melanin that they have. It's not about just teaching the true history of what has happened in the United States. Mm -hmm. We're all for teaching the truth, uh, warts and all. But um, yeah, Fault Lines by Dr. Vodibach, or by Vodibachum is, is an excellent resource on that really good and shows how the social justice movement in our culture, not just critical race theory, but critical gender, gender theory, all those things are really attacking, uh, at the root, they're attacking God's word. So let me uh, just close with a couple of prom promos here. We've got Christmas time at the Ark Encounter that has already begun, and we also have Christmas Town, so Christmas time at the Ark, Christmas Town at the Creation Museum, and those run from November 25th through December 30th, but only on select evenings, so make sure you check the calendar for that. Check our website to see which one is going to be. And uh, one of the exciting things we're working on right now, you've seen some of the new exhibits that we've been producing, and the next big one that we're doing, and I'm super excited about working on this already, is this huge model of Jerusalem. It's going to be one of the largest models in the world. And as far as we know, it's the second largest uh, indoor model of Jerusalem, but it'll be the most advanced, the most accurate. Uh, some of us went over, got to take a trip over to Israel and do some research and look at all of these first century sites. Must be nice. So we're going to try to help people understand what it was like in Jesus' day. And you're not going to just see the city. You're actually going to kind of get to experience what that would have been like. And, and yeah, I'm, I'm so excited about this one. So mm -hmm. for more details, if you've got your phone out, you can hover over that. Yeah. And that's um, we're raising funds for the building that that will be part of right mm -hmm. now. And uh, yeah. so, uh, well, we've... We're out of time well, we, here. Yeah, overstayed our welcome, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for joining us for Answer News. We'll be back next week with another edition. God bless. God bless.